MGF. Metal Gear Solid fans have had it pretty good recently, with the news about an MGS3 remake finally confirmed with the upcoming Metal Gear Solid Delta, along with the now-released Metal Gear Master Collection, a compilation of the original three games, along with ports from where it all originally began, with Metal Gear 1 and 2 back on the MSX. And having played the Master Collection on the PS5 over the last week or so, I can confirm that this does indeed do what it says on the box. You talk too much. Just with a few caveats that hardcore fans of the series might have issues with. Ooh, that's bad. Having said that, if you've never played any of these games before or haven't played them in a while, a lot of this stuff will probably go over your head and doesn't even matter to begin with. That's good. Like if the last time you played Metal Gear Solid 2 was on an actual PlayStation 2 back in the early 2000s, then you'll probably just relish in being able to play it again on a modern console. And I mean, look, that's fine. If all you ever wanted was to have an easily accessible way to play these games, well, then you're definitely gonna get your money's worth. So if that's all you wanted to know, then I guess that's the end of the video right here. Thanks for watching. However, for people like myself who've been coming back to these games over the years and are more than familiar with all the various ports and ways to experience them, well, I just can't help but see some of this stuff as being kind of lazy and lackluster. A dirt. I mean, for starters, they're calling it a master collection, but it's still like an MGS4, Peace Walker, and I never thought I'd say it, but the Twin Snakes as well. I'm sure there's probably licensing reasons as to why this collection doesn't contain some of those titles, and in its defense, it is called Volume 1, with an apparent Volume 2 also supposed to be in the works. Regardless though, all up in this collection, you're getting Metal Gear 1 and 2, but what most people are probably here for, and that's Metal Gear Solid 1 through to 3. Then there's also bonus content in the form of Snake's Revenge, along with the NES port for Metal Gear 1, which Kojima himself is said to have absolutely hated. It's also important to note that none of these games are censored or have had content removed. You can still see Meryl in her underwear, you can still watch Raiden get his junk grabbed and pissed on, My eyes! and stare at Eva's boobs all you want. The name's Eva. Look, she been in over. Claude Hammers. So on the surface, pretty damn good value with a whole lot of faithful content, and regardless of how I feel about certain aspects of this collection, there's no denying that MGS 1, 2, and 3 are still absolute bangers. That's good, Snake. They're incredibly entertaining, enjoyable titans of the gaming industry that everyone should play. And hopefully too, we don't have to hear any bitching from either the Xbox or the Sony fanboys either, because the collection is being released for both platforms, along with the Nintendo Switch and the PC. On the subject of that too, all of my footage has been captured on a PS5 thanks to an early review key. Sadly though, I wasn't able to test it out on the PC, but if the Steam page is any indicator, well, then none of these games even have mouse and keyboard support to begin with. I do know that Konami have said they're working on integrating this, and even though it should have been there in the first place, hopefully by the time that most people are watching this video, it's going to be added into the game. Because without it, it kind of defeats the whole purpose of playing it on the PC in the first place. I mean, I'd argue that most people are only buying this collection so they can play Metal Gear Solid 3 for that reason. The pain. Right, so to begin with, there's not really that much to say here about Metal Gear 1 and 2. I mean, they're pretty much all they need to be. Solid enough ports that function without any real drama whatsoever. I don't know if I'd say that you have to play these before playing Metal Gear Solid 1, but it is interesting seeing a lot of the parallels between the two of these. And going straight from these into the Solid series, you can absolutely see the similarities with a lot of those gameplay mechanics. In the way these games use the codec, focus on exploration and backtracking, along with familiar items like keycards, gas masks and rations, with it also being very stealth focused. Definitely both a product of their time, but also a bit of a testament to Kojima as a developer, who was really trying to push the envelope and thinking two steps ahead. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of if they rhyme. The story itself is heavily referenced and expanded upon in Metal Gear Solid, but most of it can be picked up along the way, so I don't think it's entirely necessary to play these first. However, the option is there. As for Metal Gear Solid's content, well, you're getting the base game, obviously, along with the special missions, the VR missions, and Metal Gear Solid Integral, with the latter two being unavailable pre-launch for, I don't know, some reason. Impressive, Snake.
Yeah, impressive snake. That's what your mum said. If you've never played Metal Gear Solid before too, then you're in for one hell of a ride. Damn. What starts off as a fairly basic mission, trying to stop a bunch of terrorists from launching nuclear weapons, turns into an absolute fever dream, where you're fighting a cyborg ninja and floating telepath, along with uncovering the entire backstory around your character's mysterious existence. As well as shooting down a chopper with a missile launch up, getting into gunfights with genetically engineered soldiers, and sneaking around in a cardboard box. Definitely plays like something from 1998, but if you can get past that, you'll really appreciate how much innovation and influence this title has added to the industry in general. The cinematics are still fun to watch. The voice acting and the writing skates that thin line between being serious and all that schlock. I've been waiting for you, Solid Snake. That's what she said. <laughs> and all those scripted action sequences are still likely to raise the hairs on your ass cheeks. However, the first thing that instantly stuck out to me about this port is that it feels like I'm playing the 50Hz PAL version. Now some people may or may not know this, but back in the day there were mainly two versions of the game. You had the PAL version, which sold in the UK and Australia primarily and ran at 50Hz. And then on the other side there was the NTSC version sold in the US and Japan, which ran at 60 both games were still capped at 30 frames per second, and it might not seem like much of a difference on the surface or even from a glance, but once you actually start playing the game, you notice a huge difference between the way both versions play, with the 50Hz version really feeling kind of sluggish and almost like you're playing in slow motion. What's with these guys? The reason for that is because you more or less are, because technically the 50Hz version is like 10% or so slower than the 60Hz one. This was actually a bit of a weird trend that a lot of power games unfortunately suffered from, and it also affected other big titles at the time like Resident Evil. Sony have got a bit of a track record of doing this too, and I remember that whole debacle with a lot of those PS Plus classic titles also getting released in 50Hz. So it is a bit of a shame that Konami didn't really seem to learn from these mistakes. And what this means is that if you're used to playing MGS at 60Hz, well, then going in and playing this version in the Master Collection is going to instantly fill off. <laughs> now, I will say that in the menu when you're loading up the game, there is the option to play with a North American and a Japanese pack. But I wasn't able to test either of these out pre-launch. And I wasn't able to get any kind of definitive answer as to whether or not this contains the 60Hz version of the game. Plus, I'm not really sure if you have to pay extra for these packs either. But regardless, the 50Hz version being the default one you play, it definitely kind of seems like a bit of a misfire. How did you like that? Aside from all of that, there's also the issue of just how crappy this port looks. And I don't mean that in like a general sense. I mean that in the fact that this is obviously just an emulation of the PlayStation version without any real kind of improvements. The image quality is really bad and often just outright blurry, to the point that at first I thought it might have some kind of filtering mode enabled or something. But in reality, oops there goes gravity, it's just because the image really is that blurry to begin with. During some of those cinematics where it's got that whole faux depth of field effect, it just outright looks completely fuzzy like the whole thing is out of focus. Can't see shit. And yes, I know that this is a game from 1998, I get that, believe me, more than anyone else does. But it is really kind of telling that the game arguably looks sharper and more clearer when you're playing it on an actual PS1. I mean, just take a look at a few comparison shots to see what I'm talking about. It does look like shit. Now to be fair, I am using an upscaler and the best possible video cable I could find on my original console, and getting it to look like this isn't exactly cheap. But then again, that's also kind of my point as well, in the sense that this Master Collection was supposed to be offering the best possible way to play these games, not to mention doing it in a way that's supposed to be convenient. Maybe on some kind of level that was Konami's intent, like they were unironically trying to make this thing look as dated as possible, as if it's some kind of throwback to a decades old platform. 
But even just the basic options to modify some of these parameters and fine tune how the game looks would have been nice and showed that some modicum of effort went into these things. Shall we go again? You ever play any of those remasters by Night Dive Studios? Well, that's a classic example of what I'm talking about. How these guys go back and remaster all these decade old games and allow them to run in widescreen, along with a bunch of other features that you'd expect in a modern title. Even being able to add in things like fake scan lines to recapture that feeling of playing in an old CRT TV, if that's what you want. So they include the classic visuals, well, as close to classic as it can get, you know, for the sake of posterity, but also let the player fine-tune how much of that stuff they actually want to leave in. So it can look as 2003 or 2023 as you want it to. But then this master collection on the other hand has none of that, and pretty much just seems to be some kind of basic emulation of the original. Not even having the option of being able to choose from something like an aspect ratio. About all the options you've got here is to change the wallpaper on the edges of the screen. Yippee. You bastard. Even like how they worked that into the remasters for the old Halo games, where you could press a single button on your controller and it would instantly swap back and forth between the old and the new visuals. But I don't know, I guess integrating a feature like that would mean that someone would actually have to put effort into it. Take it easy, I'm grateful. You do kind of expect and can excuse this for Metal Gear 1 and 2, considering those are on the MSX2, which is a really old and dated platform. But the basic innovations of even something as simple as a widescreen shouldn't be too much to ask for, considering that that was a big part of what made the HD collection so popular back in 2011. Excellent speech, my friend. They couldn't even remove the disc change screen after the sniper wolf fight either. Now it has this animation of a disc being changed over instead of it just seamlessly loading into the next area. Emulation for the PlayStation 1 has come so far these days with things like Duck Station in the ways you can modify 20 year old games and get them running on modern hardware. And even fan made emulators like this offer up a whole vast array of customization. Duck Station in particular offers up a proper widescreen hack, along with the option to more or less turn off all the texture wobbling and warping. Really? Really? And I mean, at that point, a free to play emulator offers up more functions than something they're charging almost 50 bucks for. You talk too much. Even the PC port, which came out like two decades ago, can be modified with a custom launcher so that it runs in widescreen mode still keeping the overall aesthetic mostly intact. And I think in some ways it kind of makes you appreciate the art style even more, because you can now see it at a much greater clarity. What do you mean? So if all the possible benefits of running a 20 something year old game on a current day console are completely overlooked and ignored, then what is the point of playing it on a newer platform at all? <laughs> Apart from all of that though, you know what? The game seems more or less untouched and is as faithful to the original as it could have been. So that is something to be said. So yeah, look, I mean, bitching aside, it's not the worstest thing ever made and it still presents the game itself wholly unchanged. But as a hardcore fan, it's really hard not to feel like someone at Konami has just phoned this whole thing in. And it just kind of makes me sick. Makes me sick! It's been a long time since I had such a good fight, but I'm just getting warmed up. After that comes Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3, two of the best games ever released on the PS2, and also just two of the best games ever made. Period. Metal Gear. We've been kind of fortunate too in that both of these have had a pretty good run throughout the years here, with the HD collection released back in 2011, and then even after that, the Legacy collection released in 2013. And having said that, I'm not really too sure how much praise is earned for Konami here with the Master Collection, considering both of these versions are literally just the same old HD collection, but now running at 1080p. I mean, they didn't even update the date on the main menu, and it still says 2011. They're the same picture. And in fact too, even those ports for Metal Gear 1 and 2 are clearly just the ones that were included in that version too, evident in the fact they have the exact same menu from Snake Eater when saving your progress. That's a shame. And in some ways you could even argue that it's a slight downgrade from the HD collection because it's completely lacking Peace Walker. So yeah, on some level praise is definitely deserved, but it's more so towards Bluepoint Games, who originally worked on the HD collection, not Konami. Because all those guys seem to have done here is slap their name on it and add a few new fancy menus before the whole thing loads up. 
Still though, at least in terms of the visuals, these games do fare a lot better, with both of these now running at 1080p, and admittedly, that does make them hold their own quite well, even by modern standards. Just don't go looking at any of those textures close up, because... Yikes. Why it doesn't have 4K support though on the consoles is a bit stupid and anyone's guess, but this is without a doubt the best these games have ever looked on a console. And it's kind of staggering to think that both of these are going on near 20 years old at this point. Those opening areas in the tanker in MGS2, for instance, are still really impressive and an absolute testament to just how well designed and perfect interactive environments could ever possibly be or sneak it around the jungles in MGS3, swapping camos in and out to remain undetected, and exploring those kind of environments where you can still almost feel the mosquitoes bite in the back of your neck in real time. Speaking of remaining undetected, let's have a chat about NordVPN. And yeah, big thanks to them for sponsoring this video. Right, so there are heaps of VPNs out there, but NordVPN is really built to make life easier. I'm talking about having loads of global locations that are one click away from giving you fast, secure connections. If you're anything like me as well, you'll often forget that you've got all these programs running, and the good thing about NordVPN is that it does all that stuff in the background pretty much invisibly. You can even use it to dodge shadow ISP throttling, or fire up a virtual Quake 2 LAN session with your mates via NordVPN's MeshNet feature. Word is too that MeshNet is a great workaround for Netflix password sharing crackdown too. And on the topic of Netflix, NordVPN is a great way to stream content from other regional libraries. Like recently, they added Band of Brothers to the US Netflix library, but for some reason, it's not available in Australia. Connect to a NordVPN US server though, log into Netflix, and boom, yeah, stream Band of Brothers. Plus, it also works with other streaming services that are usually region locked. So make sure to use my exclusive promo code, nordvpn.com forward slash gmanlives, to snag four extra months on a two-year plan. And to make it even sweeter, it's risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. I'm actually almost kind of jealous of people who get to experience both of these for the first time. And yeah, I might be a little bit biased, but I still think they really do showcase the peak of developer creativity and ingenuity. The sheer amount of minute details in the way you can interact with the game world here, it honestly even trumps the kind of things we still see in current day titles. I mean, never forget that in MGS2, for instance, you can literally stand there and watch ice cubes melt in real time. Freeze. Huh? And again, too, worth noting is that neither of these games have had content censored or removed. So you can still have that whack-off session in the tanker lockers with Snake, for instance, or Ogle Eva's finest assets. You're welcome. We've got company. It's the Ocelot unit. I dare you to touch your boob. Let's get out of here, hurry. My only real main issue with both of these games is that they don't have the pressure sensitive buttons from the PS2 and the PS3 versions. In the original games, when you held up a weapon, you could slowly release the square button to lower the weapon without firing, and with automatic weapons, it allowed you to also aim before shooting. Are you going to shoot me? Here though, it's got the controls from the Xbox 360 port, where you raise and lower the weapon by pressing down the left thumbstick, something that it doesn't even tell you anywhere in game, at least as far as I could tell. And yes, this is a more consistent mechanic in terms of it being more reliable, but it also removes one of the more creative elements of the original game. Plus, it downplays one of the clever little features that form the slice of a much bigger pie. Freeze. Huh? It also does have shortcomings in other areas. For instance, when you're trying to peek through lock events, there doesn't seem to be any other way to do it now than just slowly moving forward until you're right up against it. And for some idiotic reason too, the coolant spray is now used with the right thumbstick as opposed to the fire button. You know, the fire button that's been used for the past 20 fucking years. Hopefully too you don't do what I did and spend 5 minutes mashing the square button, no, but it would magically work. I also find that quick swap reloading in both of these games doesn't quite work as well either, because of how oddly sensitive the shoulder buttons are on that PS5 controller and I'm still not sure what the proper update is with the PC versions when it comes to the mouse and keyboard support, but having said that, aiming overall is super smooth and responsive anyway, and it's easily the smoothest that either of these games have ever felt to play control, mostly. It seems they've even managed to fix a lot of the slowdown issues that the PS3 version used to have too. With some areas in particular, if you ever got into combat, it just had insane slowdown, but now that's all but been completely removed, so that's a definite improvement. 
So all up for both Sons of Liberty and Snake Eater, there isn't really anything major worth complaining about, and they do a decent enough job with the assignment. It's just that that assignment was copying someone else's homework and passing it off as your own. And if you already own the HD collection or the Legacy collection and are buying this for a console yet again, then I'm not even sure I'd recommend buying it at all. Pretty tasty. It does seem like the loading times are a lot shorter now, not by a massive amount though, and certainly not enough to justify rebuying both of these games just to experience it. But look, I mean, if you think it's worth shelling out your dollar dues to play the same thing you've already played, with the only real other new inclusion being a bunch of new achievements, well, then who am I to say otherwise? And again, nothing against both of these games. They're still amazing and error-defining titles, which I would wholeheartedly recommend. You know, as much as I'd recommend drinking water and breathing. <laughs> At the end of the day, I don't think I'd entirely write off the Master Collection, and it isn't outright bad. And again, like I said earlier, if you haven't played these games in a while, or haven't played them at all, it does offer a decent enough package and a really convenient way to play them all from the one place. Metal Gear. But I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a bit disappointed with some of its aspects, considering how much better it really could have been. I mean, half-assed emulation of a 25-year-old game and an upscaled version of something that someone else did all the hard work on. I mean, that right there sums up the Metal Gear Solid Master Collection. That's bad. Ooh, that's bad. The fact that it's still missing MGS4, Peace Walker, and yes, Twin Snakes, along with all the other spin-offs like Acid 1 and 2, really prevent this from being any kind of definitive edition. So let's just hope they can somehow rectify all of that with Volume 2. But you know what? It's still a damn sight better than what Konami did with the Silent Hill HD collection, so if nothing else, it's got that going for it. What's going on? Snake! Snake! Impressive, Snake.